All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, the domestic harem uh, and within the context of uh, dreams of trespass and the harem within, which is uh, part of the book that you're reading. It's called Dreams of Trespass or the Harem Within. Um, and the chapter is the harem within as well. So uh, there are two different layers to the harem within that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, one is the harems we carry inside of us. And, the, and so those are the walls, right, that keep us away from uh, being out in the world and achieving our goals. And then the more uh, in physical terms, it's uh, we're talking about the domestic harem. And uh, so as I had mentioned, the imperial harem harems would vanish uh, with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. However, uh, domestic harems continue to exist. And they didn't have slaves or eunuchs. One way to think about uh, the domestic harem is a, a sort of an extended family arrangement. So you would have the man, uh, the, uh, a man, his sons and their wives uh, would live in the same house and the women would uh, remain secluded in the house. Uh, so um, if, if the son got married, you know, the, the son would grow up and if the son got married, then the wives would come and live with them in the harem. And so uh, uh, Mernisi uh, actually grew up in a domestic harem. And the, in, in these domestic harems, the men didn't always have many wives. Uh, what defines the harem is preserving the nuclear family uh, to keep women secluded. And it, the, the harems continued uh, throughout the, until the late 20th century. And they can still be uh, found in places like the Gulf countries, uh, you know, where the prince still feels like he needs to keep his women secluded um, uh, from other people. Uh, however, they've pretty much, you know, in most country, in most uh, countries uh, of the Middle East, they have, they're no longer, uh, uh, they, no, they don't, they no longer exist. Now, uh, uh, Marnisi, uh, she, uh, like I said, uh, was born in Morocco and lives in Morocco. Um, and so she wrote this memoir as a semi-fictional memoir. So it was published in French and in English. And it also includes historical lessons in post-colonial theory and feminist resistance. So implicit within that is she's looking at post uh, post-colonization, right? Uh, so like I, like I said, Morocco was a French colony, and so they were very much impacted by the French. She, in fact, went to French schools, and that's why, and she knew, she learned how to uh, speak French and different languages. So uh, the French, you know, brought with them uh, these kinds of uh, modern outlooks and perspectives on the one hand, but then on the other hand, uh, people uh, were still wanting to uh, keep their women in harems primarily to uh, not have to allow them to go out to be uh, subjected to the French gaze or to, um, you know, more modern, modern ways of thinking or what they would call it like foreign ways of thinking that isn't, you know, um, related to the, the culture that they already have. Uh, the uh, uh, harem that she she grew up in, the, the domestic harem was in the 19, you know, her, she was growing up there during the 1940s. But what Marnisi shows and addresses is she portrays herself as a young girl who's curious and rebellious, and she wants to understand the rules uh, and women's role in society. And what she shows by doing that is she tries to break the stereotypes that had been created about uh, women in harems uh, that I had addressed in the colonial harem, and uh, and uh, the you know the harem that becomes like part of the Western fantasy. And she shows that the women she grew up in, she grew up with, were resisting patriarchal system systems, and that there were different generations of those women. Right, and so she wants to uh, give voice to their feminist thought for the, you know, they want to give voice to their feminist thought to her generation, to Mernisi's generation. And so by writing this memoir, she's basically 
allowing uh, their voices to be heard and uh, and and showing how uh, non passive they were and how uh, much uh, they had different ways of longing to break free out of the harem walls. They educate Mernisi to be an independent woman and believe that change will happen and women will have a better future. So as a woman of the next uh, generation, she is subjected to their hopes and dreams. So a lot of her accomplishments um, as a result is, you know, comes from uh, those kinds of dreams that they had infused within her because they were growing, they were women who had been, you know, caught between colonization and post-colonization, right? And then she was a, a product, Mernisi was a product of post-colonization. But um, by the time that, you know, the French would leave Morocco, um, they, uh, a lot of the people were wanting, feeling like, yeah, we can have a, an independent Morocco where women are also, uh, can be free and they can be educated and modern. So while keeping, maintaining their culture rather than becoming sort of Western, right? Westernized. So uh, the themes of gender equality uh, come up quite a bit in the uh, in her essay, in her memoir. Um, and so here we have uh, Yasmina, her grandmother say, and you have that passage in your uh, readings. Mecca was a space. And this is, you know, again, Mecca is the place where people go to a pil on a pilgrimage. It was a space where behavior was strictly codified. The moment you stepped inside, you were bound by many laws and regulations. People who entered Mecca had to be pure. They had to perform purification rituals and refrain from lying, cheating, and doing harmful deeds. The city belonged to Allah, and you had to obey his sharia. Ah. Sharia ah is the uh, sacred law, right? Or the law of the um, of religion. So if you entered that territory, so the same thing applied to a harem when it was a house belonging to a man, no other men could enter it without the owner's permission. And when they did, they had to obey his rules. So she kind of draws this um, comparison between Mecca as a place that has rules that you had to abide by if you entered that space. And she compares those to a harem where anyone trying to enter that harem space had to abide by abide by the rules that the man of the house uh, had. Another image that comes up quite a bit in the in the harem is that it's like a tattoo uh, about the harem. And so, what what the idea is there is that um, it's an invisible harem, right? A, a law tattooed in the mind. It was frightfully, uh, for, for Mernisi as a child, that was unsettling to her. I wanted her, you know, she, she wanted to understand more. And, um, uh, and so here, a harem was about private space and the rules regulating it. It didn't need walls. Once you knew, um, <laughs> once you knew what was forbidden, you carried the harem inside uh, within, uh, inscribed under your forehead and under your skin. Uh, so what this is saying is that you don't really have to live in a harem to be carrying uh, the rules because there are rules that you try to abide by. There are rules that you, uh, even if you don't think you're doing uh, abiding or going by those rules, they are in your mind. They're inscribed in your mind and that you go about performing those rules, you go about uh, doing them without really thinking about them. So even if you if you leave the harem walls, you may still uh, carry some behavior. So uh, think about it as a concept that applies, you know, that can apply to a lot of our uh, lives, you know, what kind of invisible harems do we carry? What are those rules ins inscribed uh, in our uh, minds by our maybe experiences or uh, culture or uh, belief systems that we had or 
or something somebody said, right, that causes us to hold ourselves back and kind of uh, shut ourselves uh, from the outside world. So uh, one of the examples that uh, Marnitsi learns about how the harem is inscribed in the mind is um, when uh, Yasnina told, tells her that the farm was a harem, although it didn't have walls. So she had lived on a farm and didn't really live in a harem, but she's saying, well, it was kind of like a harem. It was pretty much a harem. <clears throat> it didn't need to have walls. If you have streets, you need uh, you only need walls if you have streets. But if you decided, like your grandfather, to live in the countryside, then you didn't need gates because you were in the middle of the fields. They were no passerby. The women could go about freely into the fields because there were no strange men hovering around, peeping at them. Women could walk or ride for hours without seeing a soul. But let's say by chance they did meet a male peasant along the way and he saw that they were unveiled he would cover his head with the hood of his own galabia um, and this is like a, a, a kind of a dress that uh, men in the countryside wear to show he was not looking so in this case Yasmina was saying that the harem was in the peasant's head it was inscribed somewhere in his forehead you know like the tattoo he knew that the women in the, on the farm belonged to the grandfather. And so then he didn't look at them. So then he, look, he would look away. And so that was an example of how the harem is something that you, you know, doesn't really require walls. Another theme uh, that comes up quite a bit in, the, um, in uh, Mernisi's um, memoir is that er gender inequality. Um, and so they... She learns a lot growing up about man-made versus religious. You know, what is man-made inequality and what is religious equality? And so um, she says, everyone is equal. Allah said so. His prophet preached the same. Uh, then the world isn't concerned about being fair to women, though. Rules were made in such a matter as to deprive them in some way or another. For example, both men and women worked from dawn until very late at night. But men made money and women didn't. That was one of the invisible rules, right? So those are like harem rules. Maybe their rules, and they're talking about women, you know, working in, in the country, for you know, in the countryside or on the land. Maybe their rules are ruthless because they're not made by women. The moment women get smart and start asking that very question instead of dutifully cooking and washing dishes all the time, they will find a way to change the rules and turn the whole planet upside down, right? So, um, so she gives her that women have to get smart and realize that the rules, um, and what there she's pointing out here is that Oftentimes, men use religion in society, patriarchal society in general, but the men in their life use religion as an excuse to say, well, women um, are supposed to not make money. They're supposed to just take care of the kids and cook and clean. But she's saying, well, that's kind of a, that's pretty much a contradiction because Allah said everyone's equal. The prophet preached the same, right? And in fact, the prophet, uh, <laughs> the prophet's, uh, uh, um, spread of Islam was uh, really uh, pushed forward by um, the women that he was married to. They are the ones who were leading the um, Islamic um, revolution and um, trying to actually improve the um, status of women, um, not so much even the status, because before Islam, um, they would... Uh, um, very disturbing but they would whenever a girl was born into a tribe um, because they wanted boys that they would uh, bury the girl alive so one of the things that um, the prophet tried to do with the help of his women was to um, make that a forbidden kind of act to say that girls are just as um, are equal you know equal to boys and there's just as a gift to the world as they are uh, as boys are 
And so he made it uh, for anyone who became Muslim, that that was <clears throat> a practice that had to be uh, put behind them. That was not uh, an allowed practice uh, to be made. But uh, what uh, Yasmin is pointing out is that, well, if they, uh, you know, were preaching some sort of equality, and, and that was the message, then how come women are still oppressed, right? So she's pointing out something that is pretty much common to, you know, in our mind, it's common, but they were doing that in a harem, right, in the 1940s. Um, so she's demonstrating that they had like a feminism that wasn't necessarily something they learned, but it was intuitive. Now, um, Mernisi's mother represents another, um, the, um, the mother represents the Moroccan bourgeois. And she reiterates the nationalist rhetoric of shedding tradition. So the nationalists, um, so that's like another generation. So even though they were ready to be free of the French colonizers, um, and, and that's her generation, they didn't want to be clinging on to uh, old traditions that kept women uh, locked in the house, that kept women's uh, roles limited, because they wanted to also free their daughters. So through the struggles of Fatima's mother in particular, Mernisi shows us how, uh, you know, uh, the exposure to European culture Im impacted women's feminine consciousness. And um, uh, so they, the French, you know, Duja remarks about French women and their customs. The French don't imprison their wives behind their walls. Uh, my dear mother-in-law, they let them run wild in the local souk, the market, and everyone has fun. And still the work gets done. In fact, so much work gets done that they can afford to equip strong armies and come down here to shoot at us. So, so you can see she's um, reflecting, you know, um, this idea that we don't need to have French there, but we also don't want to be clinging to religion. And, and there's like a generation gap between uh, Fatma's mother, uh, Duja, and her uh, and the mother-in-law, right? And they're always, so they're always um, bickering about uh, women's uh, roles. Um, so there's that tension between them. Um, you know, like much of Arab storytelling, that tension between them is a cent central thematic concern that runs throughout the, the book. Um, Mernisi's mother goes against uh, long-standing customs and insists, for example, on celebrating the birth of her daughter. Mernisi was born on the same day as her cousin Samir. And so the custom was, well, we would just celebrate the boy's birthday. We don't want to celebrate the girl's birthday. And her mother was against that. And um, she also uh, discards, uh, you know, any uh, remarks about Fatme's um, awkward features that are in stark, in stark contrast to her radiant cousin. And that's really, you know, that's really cultural. Um, and, and, you know, um, it's, it's kind of really interesting because I can totally resonate with that. Um, and it, it's, it's like my grandmother lived um, in the same building we did um, on my dad's side, not my mom's side. But, and, and it was always like, it always really bothered me so much that she always um, uh, preferred, you know, and showed more affection and, and sort of preference to my cousins who I thought were, um, didn't really show that they cared about her and were often disrespectful and just rowdy and mean. And, um, but never like uh, to me and my sister. Um, and I think that was a cultural thing. It was just that because we weren't boys, they were boys, they somehow had a better status. And, um, and it wasn't until, um, you know, we were in, in, the, in the U.S. and um, she was um, really sick and dying that, um, and asked to talk to us. And we didn't know that she was, you know, really, really sick, <laughs> another cultural tradition. But that she finally admitted that, you know, I've always admired your uh, courage and desire to learn. And I think that, you know, um, you really did a lot 
uh, better and achieved so much more than your cousins. And so it was like, for her, it was never like, I'm sorry for always like never really acknowledging your accomplishments, but it was kind of a way to say that, uh, you know, I don't know, somehow internally it was like to, to do that. And, and it meant, you know, um, it was nice to have her say that at the end. But I think what Mernisi is talking about is, you know, trying to show this kind of tension between, uh, real, you know, this religion and culture and show that a lot of this is ingrained within the culture, right? So it's another kind of a harem wall uh, that you have um, and that you grow up with where, you know, uh, men have a higher status than women. And so then those generations kind of go on uh, believing that kind of um, those kinds of and, and enacting really those kinds of behaviors. And so by showing that kind of tension, uh, she's, ex ex you know, uh, exposing also uh, the generational gaps that would exist. So Lala Mani, um, she's the matriarch of the household, is conservative and believes in respecting authority and uh, conforming to social tradition. Um, and she doesn't uh, allow Duja to go to school, right? Um, so she kind of is, um, you know, taking on the role of the mother-in-law and like, no, 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 women can't go to school, right? So that kind of generational gap. Now, uh, veiling comes in as one of the ways that uh, where uh, that tension between um, uh, culture and uh, re between religion and uh, culture comes in between what's modern and what's not. So it becomes like Western dress versus veiling. So Duja's desire to break free from her sense of imprisonment um, causes her to praise the col French colonizers. So Western dress symbolizes a rejection of um, the control of the matriarch and the patriarch and the econ economic reevaluation of women's potential. She had asked her daughter, like, if you plan to be modern, express it through what you wear. Uh, otherwise, they will shove you behind the gates. Um, so... So she, she wants her to be dressed in a Western kind of way um, because then that way she would be able to have better jobs and better um, economic status. And, um, you know, I, that is another kind of pretty much a generational thing that in other parts of the Middle East, like even in, in Syria, there was always that tension. Like I had my, you know, my mother, uh, was pushing against her mother, um, imposing on her a particular kind of, not the veil, but um, a conservative kind of dress. And then um, when she got married, my dad was very modern and, um, you know, did, was more kind of on the Western end of things. So she changed and was able to wear very much more Westernized and modern clothing. And then she would have us do the same thing. And then it creates a, a tension between like, oh, they're westernized, they're modern, right? They don't wear, um, you know, they're not religious. So that kind of gap, you know, uh, po years after the colonizers um, had left, continued to be um, a kind of an ongoing uh, struggle in culture, where when you wear a western kind of dress then you're kind of you're you're moving forward in education your career you're making that kind of assertion to society and that creates tension between those who choose to veil not that those who are veiled um don't choose to go ed get educated and have careers and and do things um in fact uh, a lot of times i found um because you know my family was very much modern and we were very much against the veil. Um, I found that women who did wear the veil sometimes had more freedom. They could be out later at night. Nobody would question them. They could drive, you know, cars wouldn't try to, you know, um, 
uh, to uh, bump up, you know, or hit them or harass them or anything like that. They were able to do so much more, whereas we had to uh, be, you know, be more careful. And we, if, if it was a past a certain time, I had to have my dad or someone come pick me up because you didn't want to be out at night, right? But if I had the veil, then I wouldn't necessarily have had as much uh, problems. So it's just kind of a really interesting, like there's no simple, clear cut way to try and um, we're going to get delve deeper into the veil, but there's never really a, a simple or clear cut way to try and make sense of uh, Western kinds of dressing and a freedom and, and veils being oppressive because sometimes, you know, it was the other way around. Those who were veiled used it as a way to break free and do whatever it is they wanted in society. Um, and then more, whereas those who chose not to were able, you know, to make progress, but then they were, we were always having to watch our steps and be careful because, you know, you could get um, harassed or um, assaulted or things like that, uh, primarily because you were saying, I am, you know, because it was that implied statement that, you know, I'm associated with the West, I'm an independent uh, and free woman. <laughs> so it's very, it's a very complex uh, subject. Um, but her mother, um, when Mernisi playfully puts on a veil, her mother shouted, um, hiding doesn't solve women's problems. It just identifies her as an easy victim. Your grandmother and I have suffered enough of this head covering uh, business. <clears throat> so her mother is very much, um, you know, uh, makes it very clear to her that she's not to wear the veil. Um, and again, you know, that was very much a part of my, you know, our growing up that, you know, my parents made it very clear that you are not going to be wearing the veil, you know, you are modern women, you're going to get your education. So it was just kind of um, ingrained. So when I read that, it very much reflects, you know, a sort of a pretty much of a generational thing. And my dad was, was always telling me, like, if anybody pressures you about the veil, then you just say, my dad says, I can't wear it, and just use me as a patriarch, and then they will leave you alone and not pressure you. Um, so the nationalist rhetoric we talked about, um, you know, she shows how women used the national independent through her mom, particularly how women used the national independence movement to push forward the agenda of their own uh, aspirations. Um, and the nationalists being, you know, kind of pretty much pushing for um, being free of colonization on the one hand, and then um, having more rights for women on the other hand. Um, but at the same time, it was the women who were pushing it. Nationalists weren't really like out there saying, we want women to have, you know, to be free. We don't, we want women to uh, not have to wear the veils. We don't want to have restrictions on the harems, right? They were being vague about it. Her mom was being more articulate about it as were some of the women in those uh, movements. And um, Mernisi talks about that tension that she sees and notices between her parents when her mother starts altering the way she wears the veil, right? Maybe showing more of her hair rather than covering all her hair or maybe putting on makeup and allowing parts of her hair to show or maybe wearing tighter clothing, right? while putting on the veil. So it becomes kind of a fashion statement rather than, than a veil or rather than a religious statement. So this dispute represented the morale all over Fez because the streets were flooded with women marching and wearing men's galabia with chiffon veil. So they started wearing women's, men's clothes, um, men's, uh, men's form of dress, right? And putting the chiffon so that it was see-through. So that was kind of their way to, um, while protesting, to make a statement, right? And um, so in 1956, uh, later when her mother heard that, and that's when Morocco got independence from the French, um, when she heard that it got, uh, that the armies were leaving, 
um, she joined the march that the wives of a nationalist had organized. And um, that march lasted through the night. And when her mother got back home, she removed her the veil uncovering her hair and face. So, uh, you know, it, it was sort of like a complete picture. We're, we're free from the colonizers and, and we are going to be free of, of the veil. So that um, her husband didn't particularly uh, like that because his mother didn't like it, probably. Um, I think it's implied in the text, too. But um, Duja, the mother, and Yasmina, the maternal grandmother, both agree that a strong personality is important in shaping women's lives. But they d differ in, in regards to what strength it requires. So Duja, the mother, believes that strength stems from aspiration towards the norms of European women. And yes, Mina sees oppression as a universal dynamic that oppresses women. And she believes education is a necessary step towards overcoming oppression. And um, yes, Mina, you know, tells Mernisi not to worry that she's going to be a modern educated woman who's going to learn foreign languages and she's going to have a passport and speak like a religious authority. And a lot of the work that Mernisi actually did was, um, uh, was speaking against religious authority and really reinterpreting um, the Quran, really reinterpreting feminism. And she's, um, she unfortunately passed away not too um, long ago in 2015, but she really paved the way for um, a lot of feminists um, and women uh, to take to take those theories and develop them further because she exposes the very you know core of of how religion has been uh, dictated by men and she um, <clears throat> does a lot of um, historical tracing which which you know when you're a feminist in the Middle East it's almost impossible not to be addressing religious somehow right because that's the tool that's used and so she was one of those uh, courageous women who uh, took that battle head on. So when you uh, see, you know, uh, Yasmina saying, you know, who's benefiting from the harem? What good can it do? Sitting here, a prisoner in a country, are why are we deprived of education? Who created the harem and for what? You know, those kinds of um, things that she expresses are um, really important because they're uh, if we think about well what are the images of women in harem right so those are like uh, uh women who it's it's completely giving you a different perspective on how women are in harems right and in the article sex in the western harem she talks about you know how west the west was very much fascinated by her book by the title of her book because of those kinds of fantasies and images and she's trying to rewrite that kind of discourse or give a different uh, perspective about it um so i'm gonna uh, pause here So I want to show you uh, a, a, a scene uh, from a film called Razia um, that really illustrates this kind of tension between uh, uh, those who are religious and those who are modern. And um, it's uh, it, the film takes place in Morocco and it goes and it spans, it shows you stories from different uh, people. So here uh, the woman is, represents the modern uh, Moroccan woman and uh, who, uh, you know, has, lives in Casa, uh, Casablanca, which is very much associated with the West. So anyone who wants to uh, be uh, free and modern and um, uh, go by Western values, they would live in Casablanca. So she represents that. And in the scenes, you can see where uh, she goes to here to visit her father's grave. And then she, there's this man who wants to start praying um, and impose himself because he, because he doesn't like um, her uh, because he doesn't like her modern way of dress. And then, um, and then when she's walking in um, the, 
a mall, I guess, or somewhere where there are men, she has this moment where they're commenting on her dress and she has this moment where she um, thinks about what she's going to do. And then I won't spoil it for you. I'll let you watch what she decides to do. So let's play that here. All right, so you can see here how uh, she, you know, made that decision and uh, mm -hmm. where she's going to assert her Western identity, her sense of independence. And it's not so much that she's asserting her Western identity, she's asserting her autonomy um, and independence as a woman, right, as opposed to not being autonomous, not feeling like she is free through her own uh, kind of uh, dress code. 